Transactions, Reports, and Bank Account Reconciliation. Hi, my name is Rod Kiles, and I am the manager of Concordia Technology Solutions Support. You can reach me one of two ways. You can reach me by email at rod.kiles at cph.org. And of course, you can reach me by phone at 314-268-1315. Um, I kindly ask that you mute your phones and or microphones and post any questions you may have into the question box. Um, for most people, they're gonna have a control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. So I think um, it should be this side of your screen here. And um, it's vertical and it usually has like a little orange um, arrow at the top of it. So you can click that to collapse and expand. Um, and you can ask any questions that you have along the way. As I'm presenting, Jordan Bogart, he's going to join me. Um, he would have hosted the session this morning. And um, he'll go through and he'll answer those questions along the way. So you don't have to wait to ask questions or anything like that. If I see them in the question window, I'll answer them. Um, if not, Jordan, he'll grab them and we'll just um, proceed on through this training. So. Um, so Jordan, he's one of our support technicians. He's been here for several years now, and he can answer any questions that you may have. Um, you can reach him by email at jordan.bogard at cph.org. And of course, you can um, give him a call at 314-268-1315. Okay, so let's go ahead and go through our um, overview, and we'll start out by going through the class agenda. So these sessions are broken down into like little chunks. So um, the first part of this whole training session is going to be the overview where we talk about the different topics that we're going to cover. Then um, we'll switch from there and we'll jump into our discussion. So we'll talk about the different um, aspects focusing on transactions and reports and bank account reconciliation, but we'll talk about those. Um, we're going to have a short five minute intermission. So about halfway through, we'll um, depending on how the material flows, but halfway through, we'll stop and um, just pause for five minutes. You can step away for a second, grab something to drink, um, try something out inside of Church 360 Ledger. But when we reconvene, we'll finish off whichever topics we had not covered inside of our discussion. So, um, so then from there, look my mouse over here. From there, we'll have a short five question quiz. No pressure with the quiz. Um, it's more like a summary or a wrap up. We had a couple choices of how we want to kind of close out these sessions and the quiz is the most popular one. So um, no pressure. If you missed the question, we're going to give the answer at the end. Um, nobody's going to contact anybody's supervisor or anything like that. So we'll have a short quiz, five questions. And then from there, we'll have um, our final question and answer session. So if there's any questions that weren't answered through the material or any questions that kind of um, popped up at the last second, feel free to post those questions. We'll grab them and answer them. Then from there, I guess we'll um, head home or head to dinner or supper or wherever we're going at that point in time. So let's go ahead and go through the uh, specific topics that we're going to cover. So we're going to start out with transactions. Um, so there's going to be different conventions that um, transactions have that's similar across all of the different transaction types. So we'll start by talking about those conventions. Then um, we'll also talk about debits and credits. So um, as we know, or as we may know, all transactions have to balance the debits and the credits, or the debits versus the credits for a transaction to be in balance and for you to submit it. So we'll discuss our um, transactions chart and talk about debits and credits briefly. So um, then from there, and actually these aren't 100% in order, like um, some of these things we'll talk about one time or another, but um, all of this will be covered. So there's also pending transactions. Whenever you enter in checks, they're going to um, start out as pending. Um, retake, do that again. So pending transactions aren't related um, to the checks. The pending transactions flow in through deposits and recurring transactions. So we're going to talk about those as well. Um, then we're going to talk about um, managing your different transactions, voiding and copying and even creating recurrent transactions. Okay, so then we'll transaction into reports where we'll talk about the general ledger report, we'll talk about the balance sheet, the chart of accounts report, and the um, statement of income and expense, not the balance sheet report twice, the statement of income and expense. So um, from there, we'll have our bank account reconciliation where we'll go through and we'll do a generic bank account reconciliation to show you the steps. Um, it's not extremely in depth, but we'll talk about all of the concepts and um, show you how it's going to work and allow you to um, understand how to complete a reconciliation on your own. Then from there, we'll show the event log and um, we'll have our quiz, have our question and answer session, and then 
will be done at that point in time. So I'm excited. As you can tell, I hope you're excited as well. If you're ready, I'm ready. Let's get started. So um, what I'm going to do is so that we can maximize our screen and focus in on the presentation, I'm going to um, turn off the webcam. And then from there, we're just going to start with a um, we're going to start with the conventions for transactions. So after we talk about the transactions, what we'll do is um, the conventions. And after we talk about the <laughs> conventions for the transactions, and then we talk about the credits and debits, then we're going to add in some deposits and show transactions at that point in time. So transactions. So when it comes to transactions, there's similarities amongst all the transactions. And you'll see that more here in just a few moments. So um, every transaction must have a date. So in some software, you can create transactions that don't have dates. Within Church 360 Ledger, every transaction is going to have a date. Um, every transaction has the option of including a descriptive memo. So it could have a memo line. Currently, it doesn't have line item memos, but it does have um, overall memos for the transaction. So it's not just the checks, but all of them can have a memo. Um, every transaction will have a minimum of two line items. So um, one has to be a credit and one has to be a debit if you only have two. But um, if you had 10 line items, you know, it could be one credit and um, nine debits or um, nine credits and one debit, you know. Um, but you have to have a minimum of two line items and between the two, they must balance. Um, the debits and credits must all must balance on all the transactions. I stole my third line there. So the debits and credits must balance on all transactions. So the system won't let you close out and finish off the transaction if it doesn't balance. So um, I guess that's kind of basic accounting. You would never end a transaction if it wasn't balanced and the software is going to help you by um, forcing you to keep it balanced when you get done there. So Okay, so debits versus credits. Um, you may have seen this chart in the last training. Um, if you haven't seen this chart or you don't have a copy of it, you may want to write it down. And um, I'll give everybody, um, you know, 30 seconds to go ahead and write this down or a minute to write this down. I keep a copy of this chart on my desk. So when I first started working here years ago, um, one of the things they gave me, you know, they gave me a set of manuals and they're like, hey, Rod, you're going to need this chart, you know, and um, they didn't even explain to me what the chart was. They're like, but you're going to need this, you know. So I got the chart and as I read through the manuals, at some point I got to the um, finance manual and um, I was able to see, hey, I am going to need this. And basically the software doesn't require you to know debits and credits, but there are certain transactions and certain things that happen in accounting that happen when you're working with the finances that understanding the credits and debits give you a deeper understanding of what's going on. And um, especially when dealing with journal entries, um, understanding the credits and debits allow you to know when something is going to increase or decrease. And maybe I should start saying debits and credits. But um, so whenever you're um, working with it, assets are going to behave um, differently than liabilities. Incomes are going to behave differently than expenses. But um, they're always going to behave in this manner. When you debit an asset account, it's going to increase. When you credit an asset account, it's going to decrease. So they'll always behave that way. Um, the asterisk is a note for these um, these uh, transactions or this debits and credits chart. The money in a restricted fund is held in an asset account. And you would have learned that in the last training session, but it's going to become even more clear when I show up a few of the transactions here. Um, we're actually going to be decreasing the balance of the checking account um, alongside of delete, decreasing the amount of the restricted fund when we write our transaction. So we'll show that here in just a moment. Okay, so deposits is going to be the very first transaction type. So before I go through all the bullets on deposits, what I want to do is switch over and log into the software. And I'm going to show um, two different ways of creating deposits. And then I'll show copying things here in just a little bit. But I'm going to show um, creating a deposit manually within the software. But I'm also going to show um, pulling the deposit over from Church 360 members whenever the offering batch creates your deposit. So I'm going to show that as well. OK, so let me switch screens here. 
And um, you'll notice here that I'm using Google Chrome. You can use um, any of the web browsers, but you can use Google Chrome. And I've got my multiple tabs here across the top. I'm going to use the Learn.360 members. Uh, restate that the Learn.360 Ledger website. And I'm going to log in with my email address. And then type in my password. So um, if you forget your password, it does have an option to reset your password. And if you didn't receive lockout instructions, um, unlock um, instructions, you can um, have those recent as well. So I'm going to click sign in. That's going to allow me to sign into the software. Each church is going to have their own website. And um, you're going to land here on what I call the transactions view. It's really the home page, but you know, running down the screen, you'll be able to see all of your um, transactions. So um, this is a test site, so it's not full of transactions, but there are some transactions inside of here. Okay, so um, I'm going to pull up this site. Um, Church 360 is a suite of products. So Church 360 has Church 360 members, Church 360 Unite, and Church 360 Ledger. Um, Church 360 Members is a church management software that allows you to manage um, your church members, your visitors. It allows you to enter in offering records, um, record attendance, look at trends, um, all kinds of different things. Follow up on visitors, record notes, um, print out calendars. There's, there's all kinds of things. Um, church 360 Unite is a website building program that allows you to have a web presence with pages and blog posts. Um, online groups, there's all kinds of things. But um, the two that we're gonna look at today is Church 360 members, um, because that's gonna allow us to record offerings and transfer that offering batch over to Church 360 Ledger. And um, we're gonna look at Church 360 Ledger where we can retrieve that offering batch or we can just enter in a deposit. So um, let me go ahead and switch back to our PowerPoint and um, kind of talk about what deposits are here inside out of Church 360 Ledger. So deposits allow users to deposit money into asset accounts. So whenever people um, put offerings in the plate, um, somebody's going to count those offerings up. Um, most likely they'll enter them into Church 360 members. Those, that offering batch will flow over into Church 360 Unite, and then the treasurer will pull that deposit down and um, make that deposit live at that point in time. So um, basically, deposits allow you to record money into your assets. Um, there we go. Um, examples are offerings, which is going to be the bulk of the money that's brought in. Um, but it could be rental income. I guess it could also be bank interest. Um, those are the different types of um, deposits that you can enter into the system. Um, when it comes to bank interest, you may actually use a journal entry for that, though. Um, so these transactions are limited to assets and income accounts. So one thing that we wanted to do when we set up this software was to promote good practices, so best practices. So um, when you enter in a deposit, it is just assets and income accounts. It won't allow you to do a deposit into an um, expense account or a liability account. Um, if you need to use other transaction types, um, I'm going to say that differently. If you need to use different account types when doing a transaction, you'll just use a journal entry to um, create those transaction types or create those transactions. Now, if there's a, let me say, state this now, if there's a certain transaction that you're having a problem creating, um, feel free to post that in the question box and um, I'll show you how to do that transaction during this session. I'm going to cover all of the main ones. Um, but if there's a complex one or something unique that you've been struggling with, feel free to post that and I'll show you how to do that transaction as well. You can also contact our support team and they can help you create those transactions. So um, the fourth bullet on this is deposits do integrate with Church 360 members. So um, I've stated it a couple of times, so I won't say it again, but you can integrate with Church 360 members. Okay, so I'm going to... Uh, Go back to Church 360 Ledger. I'm going to show the traditional deposit first. So I'm going to show you how to just simply enter in a deposit. So whenever it comes time to create transactions, you'll go to New Transactions. 
then you'll go down to deposits and it will bring up a window like this. So um, what you'll see is you'll see memo, you'll see date, you'll see payee. Um, when it comes to deposits, you're probably not selecting a payee. That's why it says optional here. But um, when you're working with it, you can enter in a payee. I don't know why you would, but the option is there. Then there's assets, and then there's also um, income accounts. So assets, income accounts, amounts, and amounts. So each one of these areas is going to be considered a line. So memo, payee, date, then asset, dollar amount, that's going to be one line item. Then income, dollar amount, that's going to be a second line item. And you can enter in multiple line items. So you could have 20 on each side if you really needed to. So in looking at this, you'll notice how my checking account says unrestricted, and I'm going to make this just a little bit bigger. Let me let me try right there, and I may have to zoom back out here in just a moment. So um, you'll notice how mine says unrestricted, and then it says building memorial missions scholarship fund. So let me close this, and I'm going to jump over to the um, chart of accounts here just for a second. So I'm going to go to the gear and go to chart of accounts. And inside the chart of accounts, um, lots of churches use a form of dedicated or restricted money. So um, when people give to your church, they're going to give um, money to your general fund, but they also may give money designated for a specific purpose. And if that's the case, you may want to use restricted funds. Um, restricted funds are different than the dedicated accounts that you would have used in Shepherd Staff. So restricted funds are part of the asset um, account. So like you'll notice how I have building fund, memorial fund, mission, scholarship, and youth fund, and how those are directly underneath unrestricted. If you add up the 172,000, the 132,000 plus 1,000, 2,000, another 1,000, that's going to give you the total bank account balance, $311,000. So um, the restricted funds, instead of being um, a dedicated account or a liability account, they're actually part of the asset. Um, so that's going to be on one side of your transaction. And then on the other side of your transaction is going to be, in the case of deposits, it's going to be an income account. So um, every single dollar is going to go through the statement of income and expense. Every single income item, every single expense item. Um, there are, There is a, um, I guess, a faction or a percentage of people who only want budgeted items on the statement of income and expense. They don't want restricted items um, on there. They don't want dedicated items on there. If that's the case, then um, you can separate your chart of accounts when it comes to income and expenses, and you can have an unrestricted and a restricted section or a um, dedicated and undedicated or budgeted and unbudgeted section on your um, statement of income and expense, and then you can export it to Excel and delete that section out if you'd like. So th there is the possibility of that, but um, the way that we got this set up, we do have it set up to show restricted funds, and they are tied directly to the bank account. So in working with this, I'll go to new transaction and I'll go to deposit. And I'm inside of here, I'll select my unrestricted checking account, and then I'll enter in the dollar amount that I have for my unrestricted checking account. So let me grab my numbers here. So let's say that the unrestricted amount was $5,000. Then mission fund, and let's say the mission fund was $1,000. Youth fund, was $500. And then the building fund was $300. Okay, so um, you'll notice how I have restricted on this building fund. If, um, if and when I'm using dedicated accounts, um, it will say like asset, um, the account type here at the top. But sometimes when you have the same item as an asset and income and expense, just having it simply named with an extra adjective at the end or at the beginning, depending on where you wanted to put it, um, helps distinguish that it's restricted or dedicated or income or expense. So um, that's one little 
convention that I found along the way. So I put restricted on here to show that. So then these are all going to be assets. So all this money is going to go into that checking account. This is all going to go into central trust checking. It's actually this part of the breakdown here. But then over here, I'm going to have to fill in the income. So general fund, building fund, mission fund, and I can put those in order. I can match them up here. Mission fund, youth fund, and building fund. So I put them in the same order there. Now, um, since it shows the 6,800 here at the top, usually I'll take that amount out. Then I'll go over here and type in the amounts at that point, and it'll start subtracting here at the bottom. So 5,000, 1,000, 500, and 300. Okay, so um, this is if you're using restricted funds. Now, if you're not using restricted funds, then you won't add those items in over here. And then this would just be $6,800 and you would select your bank account here on the left hand side. So this would be central trust checking. It wouldn't have unrestricted in front of it. It'd be $6,800. Then this would be your breakdown here over income. But um, if you are using the um, restricted funds, then um, you'll want to restrict the asset portion of it when you're creating the transaction so that um, it increases those balances and then um, it'll show correctly on all of your reports here inside of the system. So, okay, so I'm gonna change that back to $5,000. So from there, um, let me call this Sunday offerings. Then I'm going to review my date. Let's say that this went to the bank on Monday. Then um, at that point, I'll click save and it'll simply save my transactions. Um, down at the bottom, it will show debits and credits. Um, it'll say $6,800 on both sides. And then you'll just click save. And that'll save that transaction. Once the transaction is saved, you'll be able to go to the orange dollar sign, the home button, and you'll be able to see that transaction here inside of the view. Now, when you hover over a transaction, it does show all of the line items related, all of the assets or liability line items related to that transaction. So the home screen is just showing assets and liabilities. It's not showing income and expense accounts. So we're looking at this, this is deposits, and these are all four line items for the deposit. You can click on any of those line items. I usually click on the date here on the left and I make sure I'm not clicking on the hyperlink because those hyperlinks have um, destination. So if I click here, it'll actually take me to that part of the um, chart of accounts at that point in time. So I make sure to click on the date here on the left and then that'll open up my transaction. If I need to make any changes, um, I can make those changes. When it comes to um, changing a transaction, you can do it up to the point that you reconcile that transaction. You'll notice running down the left-hand side, there's this little reconciled column. And um, with that reconciled column, if there's a lock in that column, then that transaction has been reconciled. If there's not a lock there, the transaction has not been reconciled. Um, there's also times where you'll see a little unprint icon. That means that transaction has not been printed. Um, if it's blank, it means it's just ready to go at that point in time. Okay, so that's how you'll um, manually enter in a pending, uh, enter in a deposit. So um, you heard me say pending there just for a second. I'm thinking of the next thing, the direction we're going in. Um, when you enter in a, basically enter in a deposit through entering in your offerings, it's going to flow into pending transactions. So um, I'm going to go over to Church360 members and I'm going to log in. And um, so I'm logging into the, um, I guess the counterpart, the, the site that's connected to the site that I have. So um, this here is learn.360ledger.com. And this is learn.360members.com. So these are tethered together. So at this point, I can go to offerings and I can enter in offerings for um, last Sunday. So I'm going to just move this forward. This is September 12th. So we'll go to last Sunday here. So to add a new batch, and I'm not going to go into all the details for entering in a batch. I'm just going to enter in um, 
the number of offerings that I need to make a deposit so that we can represent it. So when you create a batch, you'll select the date that the offerings were given. You can tie it to a service. Then from that point in time, um, you can go through and type in the name or type in the number. So um, click here. And then if I press number one and press enter, it'll allow me to select it. This is optimized for keyboard input, but um, it could be something where um, you use the mouse as well. So you can go through and select the way that they gave. So let's say Dave and Sue Abbott, they're going to be the one who gave us $5,000. Um, you can enter a memo. Then you'll notice here on the right hand side that you can say, please enter um, or press enter, not please, but press enter to add this offering. And then you can press enter at that point. Um, and then it just takes you to the next line. And it's really, um, it's kind of like, a, I guess for the, us that are old enough to um, remember um, using a typewriter, it's kind of like that, where you're going left to right, then you press enter, you have the carriage return, and it returns all the way back to the next line, and then you keep going for it. I guess I'm showing my age at that point. So, um, so number two, and then enter, and say they wrote a check, press enter, it was check number one, two, three, four, enter. Then um, let's say that they gave to the mission fund, and I could type the number, if I know the number, I can type the name of the fund, and then I can type in that amount. So say they gave um, $1,000, and press enter. Then um, we're also going to add in the youth fund. So three, and say they wrote a check, and then youth fund, uh, that's number three. And then say that that was $500. Then um, we'll do one more fund here, and we'll just say David and um, Shirley here. Say they gave electronically, so I could press three and press enter. And then let's say, what's my last fund? It's the building fund, so that's number four. And then say that was 300, and then I could press enter. Now, um, two quick things. You can go back and edit these if you make mistakes, so you can click in there and just make changes if you needed to. Um, you can record giving to more than one fund at a time as well. So it doesn't just have to be a single fund. And there's keyboard shortcuts and navigation for that as well. So, um, and whenever you press enter, it automatically um, saves your transaction at that point in time. And I have a little save button over here. Okay, so we've entered in our um, offering records. Then from there, um, it automatically hands it over to Church 360 Ledger. Now, if I have the window open, the system isn't going to know to reach out to the server, but um, you can just refresh or reload your page, and then it will um, find that pending transaction. So we just went from um, five pending transactions up to six pending transactions. So um, I'm going to get rid of this deposit here. Did I just dismiss my deposit? Mm. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. I just dismissed my deposit that I just created. Um, I was going to say this, but I'm going to have to say that now. When, um, when it comes to these pending transactions, if you dismiss them, they are... Um, gone forever at that point in time. Um, I wonder if I change this, if it'll make it come back, but I believe they're gone at that point in time. I did not mean to do that. Mm. Yeah. Sorry about that. Let me add that deposit in one more time there. I'm going to delete this batch and new batch the ninth, add eighth, Sunday, add Okay, 
added that back in. Okay, then go to Ledger. Then I'm going to refresh my screen here. Um, please do not dismiss your um, batches like I did there. Um, once it's gone, it's it's literally gone. Like it's it's disabled at that point. So September 8th, $6,800. Our deposit is $6,800. Six, $5,000, That's $6,800. So at that point, you'll be able to click on the um, line item and it will pull in the funds, the giving funds. So every single offering is going to be attached to a giving fund. These little bubbles, these colored bubbles here, those are the funds that are listed here inside of Church 360 members. So um, they have the exact same colors and everything. And if you go to the gear and go to funds, that's where that list of funds is showing. In most cases, your income accounts are going to, um, th there's going to be a matching income account for each one of the giving funds. Um, in most cases, I've seen churches that don't have it that way. They have like a, like a catch all income account for um, restricted funds and they have a catch all income account for all of their income. I've seen that before, but in most cases they'll match. Um, you'll have to assign the income account to that fund. So these have been assigned in the past. The system will remember that you've assigned that income account to that um, giving fund. But over here on the right hand side, you will need to um, go through and state where the money is going to be going each time that it comes in. So um, you'll just go in here and you'll type in these options and select them. Unrestricted is going to be 5,000. Um, building fund is going to be 300. Youth fund is going to be 500. And mission fund is going to be 1,000. So um, from there, what you'll do, memo and Sunday offering batch. Then at that point in time, you'll click save and it will save that offering batch. So um, it's going to happen one of two ways. Either you're going to be pulling those offerings in from Church 360 members or you're manually going to be entering those um, offerings in through a deposit, one or the other there. OK, so that's how you'll do a deposit. Let's take a look at checks and checks has a Y in the road as well. Um, but let's let's go through the different bullets for checks first. So um, checks allow users to print checks or record handwritten checks. And that's the Y in the road that I'm talking about. Um, some churches still have checkbooks and they're writing them out of these checkbooks. Some churches will print checks onto check stocks or check blanks and then um, they'll distribute those checks that way. So there's a little why in the road there. So it allows you to do both. Um, these are going to be used for paying payroll and for paying church bills. They'll um, give you the ability to print laser checks or inkjet checks. So um, just depending on the type of printer you have, um, laser printers have come down um, quite a bit. So lots of churches have laser printers, but inkjet printers is probably still the most popular printer. Like I, that's what I have at home is inkjet. So. And you can also order checks from formsplusinc.com. So um, this is a company that we've been dealing with for as long as I've been here. Over, man, it's got to be over 20 plus years, probably longer than that. But um, these checks work with Church 360, um, with Church 360 Ledger. So like if I go to checks, then from there, scroll down just a little bit. There's Church 360 middle checks and Church 360 top checks. Um, if you get your checks from somewhere else, they may not line up perfectly. Like um, the items may not show up properly or they might print on top of something else. So these are the checks that we tested with and these checks do work. Um, you can order them from other places, but there's times where they just simply don't line up. Okay, so from there, um, you can enter two types of checks. You can enter a handwritten check or you can enter in a um, check that you're going to print. So to enter in a check, what you'll do is you'll go to new transactions and you'll go to check. And then um, I always like to do snow removal. So um, snow removal and then um, you can select the date. Let's say we're going to do the handwritten check first. Yes, understood, Kurt. Thanks. Um, awesome. So um, enter in the date. This is a handwritten check, 9-12, and payee, um, 
the payees can be entered on the um, on the fly, or you can actually create them and enter them um, into our payees part of the software. And I probably should show that here just for a second. So with payees, there's going to be the gear, and then there's going to be payees. Um, if you're importing from Shepherd Staff, it'll pull all of your payees in. Um, if you need to add in an additional payee, you'll scroll to the bottom, click on add a new one, type in first name, last name, company, and then type in the um, address, city, state, and zip. So this allows you to enter in all of your payee information. Um, if you're entering the payee on the fly, so you go to new transaction and go to check, and um, you're just typing in their name. So say this is um, Joe's snow removal or whatever. Then um, it'll add Joe's snow removal to your list of payees, but it won't have like first name, last name, address, and all those things. So um, if you're writing checks, you may want to include that information. So you may just want to go ahead and create the transact or create the payee prior to actually creating the check. So this is snow removal. Then um, you'd select your bank account. So this is probably coming out of unrestricted. Um, I don't know how much it costs to get snow removed, but um, from there, then um, you'll select your expense account. And then um, unless it's restricted, then on the left-hand side, you'd select your restricted fund, and then you'd select your expense here on the right-hand side. Now, if it's a handwritten check, you'll know the check number because you're handwriting it. And you can type in your um, check number at that point. So I'm going to do 750. 750. So that's going to be our check number. Um, you can either enter your check numbers when you are printing your, um, either enter your check numbers when you're entering in your check or enter your check numbers when you're printing your check. So if you enter in a run of checks, you're probably not going to type in all your check numbers when you're gonna you know, print the checks from the computer, you're just gonna leave this blank. But since this is our representation of a handwritten check, I'm just gonna type in 750 and let that be the number that this check is going to receive. So then at that point, um, I'll review my credits and debits down at the bottom, make sure everything balances, and then I'll click save. And then that will um, save my transaction. It'll send it to the print queue. Now this green banner at the top only lasts for five seconds. So um, if you don't get to it quick enough or um, you have some other checks to enter and you're going to go to your print queue later, then you can just go up to the print queue and you'll be able to see those transactions in there. So um, let me enter in um, a couple more checks. So um, that's like if I'm just going to pay a um, single person there. And this is going to be a payroll check. Let me get my line items here. Okay, so for the payroll check, new transactions check, then at that point, say we're going to pay, um, let's say Pastor, is Pastor Kent Williams in here? No. We'll use Derek Woods here. So Derek Woods, and this is salary check. And then um, at that point in time, um, we're probably paying it out of unrestricted. And then that amount is going to be the net amount, not the gross amount. So um, the gross amount is going to show over here on the right-hand side when we select our um, expense account at that point in time. So that'll be the total amount that you're um, paying the person at that point in time. So um, that amount in my check is actually $833.33. So um, back to the left, we could select any other um, deductions that are going to take place on the check. So like federal income tax, um, state income tax, Social Security, and let's see, I have Medicare. Yep. So um, I can enter those in at that point in time. I'll correct that 180. So Federal income tax is 95.10. State income tax is $22. Um, you don't have to type the pennies. So Social Security is 51.67, and um, Medicare is 12.08. Um, and when I say you don't have to type the pennies, I mean you don't have to type the zeros. You, you do have to type the pennies if you want it to be accurate. Um, but um, like if you if it's zero zero, then you could just type 22 without the um, decimal point and the other numbers at that point in time. But 
Um, at that point, everything's going to balance out. You won't see any differences here on the right or here on the left. Um, the liabilities do go here on the left-hand side in this case because um, they are going to be debits to the um, account. So over here, when we get down to the bottom, I'm sorry, they're going to be credits to the account. You get down here to the bottom, we'll see those credits here on the right-hand side. So checking, federal, state, Social Security, and Medicare are all credits on this transaction. Okay. So then I'm going to click save and it's going to save that um, transaction. So that's how you can manually enter in a payroll check. Now we do offer the option of importing paychecks, um, payroll checks, and most of those are direct deposits nowadays. But um, if you are mailing checks with paychecks, we do have the option to import both of those, the direct deposits and import in the um, checks that are being written from that software as well. So there is a payroll import. Okay, so um, let me enter in one more check so that I can have um, two checks in the system. So I'm going to go ahead and um, pay the electric bill as well. So um, in our area, it's a company called Ameren. And say this is, this is the month of September, so say this is the August electric bill. And um, I'm going to leave the check number blank. We're going to let the software assign that. The unrestricted checking. Um, I don't know, $458 for the electric bill, electricity. And then I'm just going to save that. So I have three checks in the system now. And I'm just going to refresh this screen since I'm already on the print queue window. And when it comes time to print our checks, um, we're kind of going to be at a Y in the road. If it's a handwritten check, then um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to check the checkbox for that check or select the checkbox for that check. Then I'm going to say mark as printed. And then um, this is just going to remove that check out of the queue. Now, um, one little trend I've seen for people who are new to the software is sometimes they'll let the checks hang out here in the print queue for a time period until they feel comfortable marking them as printed. Once you mark it as printed, then that check can no longer be edited or modified. So, um, you know, just a thought that uh, might help some people out. You don't have to, just because you put it in the print queue, it doesn't mean you have to mark it as printed as soon as it gets there. I have seen some people kind of let it hang out there until they felt comfortable with everything. Okay, so that'll take it out of the print queue. And um, when you go back here to pending transactions, pending transactions, when you go back here to the transactions view, you'll be able to see that check without a um, print um, or need to be printed icon here on the left-hand side. And uh, when you click on it, you'll notice how the top part is grayed out and it's now um, inaccessible. So transaction has been printed. You can't make changes at that point in time. Okay, from there, um, we do have a couple checks that we do want to print from the system. So we'll check the, or select the checks that we want to print, and then we can click print. Then at that point, um, it's going to assign the next highest check number. So 751 and this next one should be 752. So we're going to be able to see those um, checks here in the system, review them, make sure that they look the way that they should. And then at that point we'll click print at the top of the window and it'll show 751 and 752. If there's something wrong, these can be changed inside of this window. So if it's not the check number that we um, expected, we can just type in the check number that we want. Then the next check number in this scenario that I have right here would be 754. So it would be um, one check number higher at that point in time. So you can change it at this point in time if something's not right. So then um, it'll hand the check off to your web browser print controls. Um, I'm using Google Chrome. Um, and I've become familiar with it, and that's one of the main reasons why I use it. But you can go to more settings, and then there's different settings that you can change within this view. So um, most people will hide the headers and the footers so that they don't end up getting um, information on the check that they don't want. Um, you can also adjust the margins. So um, every printer is not exactly the same. Sometimes you'll have a an extra eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch at the top or on the sides. So um, you can um, use no um, margins, you can use minimum margins, you can use custom margins, 
where you can um, type in the size of the margin. So if this is um, too high or too low, um, you can type in and change the margins and move everything around. I think I did zero on that instead of 0.75. So, um, but you, you can adjust the margins to kind of move everything up and down at that point in time if you need to. Okay, so from there, once um, everything looks the way that it should, then you'll just click on print and send it out to the printer. If um, everything works the way that it should, you'll pull it off the printer. It'll be lined, aligned to the check perfectly. Um, if you pull the check off of the printer and it doesn't look right, um, you'll just go back in here and say that the Ameren check was correct, but the check to um, Pastor was not. Then you could um, uncheck the, or let's say like this. So Ameren was correct. I'll check that one and I'll mark it as printed. Then I can go to this other one and then I could print, um, make sure that the check number is correct, print again, print and then confirm and then it'll allow me to print that check again and I can keep printing it until it's correct at that point in time, make whatever adjustments that need to be made. So, but then I'll mark that one, then say mark as printed and confirm and then I'll be done at that point in time. So that's how you can um, enter in and print your checks. Okay, so the um, third of four, and actually, let me go back to my PowerPoint, payments. So the third of four transaction types is payments. These allow users to record online or electronic transactions. So for years, all we did was we wrote checks and we mailed checks and we did all that. But um, nowadays, you probably write very few checks and you probably receive more checks than you even write when you're a church, but um, most likely you're making the majority of your payments electronically. Those are going to be payments. So they're not going to have a check number. The view is very similar. It has a memo. It has a date. Um, we can do the Ameren thing again here. So payee, we can say Ameren, or let's say Missouri American Water. And then um, that could be unrestricted. Um, say that the water bill was for one month, $152. And then you could go over here and you could select water. And then with this being a payment, when you click save, it creates the transaction. There's no um, pending or a hold or anything like that. It's just live at that point in time. And it applies to your balance at that point in time. So. Um, it's just in the system. If you need to make a change, say it was 152.25, you just click on the row. And then you just make that change at that point in time. Printing out a check is a little bit different. Um, you probably have to void the check at that point in time to correct it if, if you've had a mistake of 25 cents. Now, if, when you make a mistake, this system keeps running balances. Like it's um, as accurate as anything I've ever seen. Um, so when I added in that 25 cents, it added in another line item in the background, adjusting that transaction by 25 cents. So um, we went from um, 152 to 152.25. We decreased our um, checking account by 25 cents. So it's keeping that um, running balance here and making that adjustment. Okay, so um, that's how you'll enter in a payment. Um, I think payments are, are pretty easy inside of this software. Let's switch from there and we'll go from payments. Oh, let me read the other line items for payments. So allows users to record online or electronic transactions. These are limited as well. These are limited to assets, liability, and expense account types. So um, it doesn't allow you to do income. You can't pay something out of an income. You'll use a journal entry for that type of transaction. Um, examples are EFTs for utility bills, like my Ameren payment and my Missouri water payment there. Um, payment for bank fees. So um, if you have to you know, do that electronically, you could use a journal entry, but you could also use a payment to say that you paid your $8.99. If you have a, um, a payment for using the bank account, most of us are going to try to get um, banking with no fees. But if you do, you can use a payment for that. Okay, so the... Um, fourth of five types of transactions is the transfer transactions. This is used to represent electronically transferring money between banks 
or to make line item corrections. So whenever you do a transfer, it's always going to be the same um, account type on both line items. So only allows moving money between similar account types. So asset to asset, expense to expense, um, liability to liability or income to income. So um, I guess you could also say um, it could be um, unrestricted to restricted fund because both of those are assets as well. Okay, so let's go back and um, say we want to move money from checking to savings. We could do a transfer. And um, so this is transfer um, to fill checking account. So we could say that we're taking the money out of um, our farmer's savings account and say it's $5,000 and we're moving money into our unrestricted checking account, and it's $5,000, and then we could click Save. Um, so when people start using the software, when they're brand new and fresh with it, most of the time when they do a transaction um, or when they do a transfer, it's going to be transferring money from unrestricted into their restriction. So um, when you do this, it doesn't decrease the value of the asset, it just decreases the amount of money that you have um, restricted and um, I'm sorry, it decreases the amount of money that you have unrestricted and then it restricts that money into the account that you're going to put that money into. So this is how people will use it when they first get started. But um, after they've got everything set up, they're probably going to be doing either line item corrections or they're going to be um, or they're going to be moving money like a transfer from checking to savings or from savings to checking. So this one here, um, a credit on the um, unrestricted is going to decrease it and a debit is going to um, increase the restricted fund at that point in time. Okay, so I've been talking for 53 minutes now. So before we get to um, journal entries, let's go ahead and um, take our, I'm going to start my timer here. Let's go ahead and um, take our five minute um, intermission and then we resume we'll start on journal entries hop into um, reports and we'll go from there so timer five minutes start so thanks everyone
Okay, awesome. Okay, thanks everyone. Hope you had a wonderful intermission there. Okay, let's go into journal entries. So um, with journal entries, they're gonna allow users to record account balance corrections, um, enter in interest earned and enter in bank fees. Um, I've also seen people use journal entries to enter in complex um, payroll transactions as well because you can go in and do any kind of credits and debits at that point in time. Okay, so with this, you can utilize all four account types. Um, so let's go ahead and then we'll come back and we'll show voiding transactions. So, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> um, excuse me. <clears throat> excuse me. Sorry about that. Voiding transactions. So we'll go back to Church 360 Ledger and let's enter in a few journal entries. So I'll go to journal entries. Then um, from there, a journal entry that we're going to do is we're going to do um, bank interest. So recently I found out that some people use deposits to represent their bank interest. And um, if you use a deposit for bank interest, um, you, you get the same result. So technically it's not wrong. Um, and I, I would say, hey, continue doing what you're most comfortable with. If you're using deposits, that's perfectly fine. You could you know, switch it to a deposit and um, just enter in a deposit. But um, with the, um, let's see, we're going to do bank interest. So this is going to go into unrestricted checking, and then we're going to have an income account for interest income. So um, earlier when we were showing our credits and debits chart, and let me show that on the screen here just one second. There we go. Okay, so with credits and debits, um, we're always going to use this chart to double check our work to make sure we're really increasing and decreasing appropriately for our asset account. So the question, um, Lots of times people will be like, hey, credit really decreases the asset account, and the answer is yes. Um, that is correct. Um, I, I think in our head and our society, the way that we use credit, we think it gives us more money, but technically it's taking money away from us, like we're further in debt anytime that we use credit. So um, crediting is a decrease and debiting is an increase. So we are going to um, go back to here. And we're actually going to increase, so we're going to credit our unrestricted and say our bank interest, the dollar twenty-five. Then we will, um, and actually did that backwards. Hmm, I just mentioned it too. The debit on the um, account is going to be dollar twenty-five there. That's going to be an increase. So debit is going to increase, credit is going to decrease, and then for interest income, the balance on our transaction that's going to be a credit. So let me switch back to our PowerPoint here. Um, so credit on the income, debit on the asset. So increase asset with the debit, increase the income with a credit. So we know we got the results that we wanted. There we go. Then we'll click save and we can even go to um, our account. We can go up here and we can look at our central trust checking. And then um, when that loads, we can see that we went up $1.25 in our balance here. So that's working the way that it should. So then, um, so that's going to be doing bank interest. We can do the same with bank fees. So we can go to journal entries and we can do bank fees. Um, I've heard of people using payments for bank fees. So this is bank fees. And it would be unrestricted checking you probably use for your bank fees. And then you could have a... Um, bank fees account so and we know that credits so say the bank fees were 7.99 or 8.99 and then we could um, go through and enter in that information when we look at our credits and debits chart um, a credit is a decrease for an asset account and a debit is an increase for an expense account so one's going down this time and one is going up and um, as we know from our earlier training today income and expense accounts both um, go up throughout the year until you run your um, year end by locking the book 
then it's going to zero out those income and expense accounts and it's going to apply that difference to our equity account in the background to keep our accounting equation in balance um, whenever we're using the software throughout the year or throughout the years at that point in time so bank fees and then we can click save and we can um, look here at our central trust checking again and now that's gone down by seven dollars and 99 cents so um, if there's a complex um, journal entry you want me to show you can enter that into the uh, question box and I'll show that transaction but though those are the two journal entries that I had to show um, next we'll do um, voiding transactions so I'm going to go through and we'll go down to voiding here okay so um, voiding transactions what they do is they cancel the effects of the transaction so um, I think lots of times people think voiding is zeroing out what took place it's actually entering in a reversal so earlier when you showed when I showed editing that transaction it added another line item well that's what happens when you void a transaction you're adding in one or more line items um, you know offsetting the um, initial action that took place with that transaction so um creates a hidden um reversing transaction and groups the two transactions together is what it does so um this cannot be undone so you want to be careful when voiding um, i guess worst case scenario if you avoid a transaction you just enter in another transaction at that point in time so um that's where my intermission was supposed to fall so let's go ahead and let's go back into here um, if we enter in a transaction um, I'm going to scroll down and let's say we had this payment here. Um, yeah, actually, let's use this Ameren check here. We wanted to void it. Um, we can just go in here, we can void, and then that will um, get rid of that transaction. So it'll hide it from this view, but it'll actually still show in our general ledger um, part of the software. I'm going to show that here just one second. Um, the one thing that I want to show before we go over to the general ledger is that you can make transactions recurring. So I just basically clicked on that transaction and, um, oh, this one's already recurring. So let me pick a different transaction here. Um, nope, that one's recurring as well. So let's go to the transaction I created earlier for Mr. Woods here. So click there and then um, scroll down and I can make that recurring. Um, I can state the name of the transaction. So I don't want all mine to say um, salary check. So I could say salary check for Derek Woods. And then I could say when it's going to take place every other week. And it could be on a Friday. And then at that point, I could save it. If it's something that's going to happen more than once a month, I need to create two transactions that kind of interweave amongst themselves so that um, I can do it twice a month. So it doesn't give you the option to do something twice a month. You just have to create two recurring transactions and then um, save it and then it will create that transaction here, click the gear and recurring transactions. And it will create that transaction here underneath our recurring transactions. When that time period comes, when that Friday um, rolls around, you'll be able to see that transaction here underneath your pending transaction. So it'll show with all of your other pending transactions. So um, that could be used with direct deposits for pastor like we have here, but it could also be the electric bill, could be any of the utilities. So any recurring bills can just be entered into here. You'll click on those recurring bills and generate them just like you did the deposit. You'll review the amounts, um, make sure your credits and debits are correct, and then you'll just save down at the bottom and then it'll move it into either the print queue um, or well, it'll move it into the um, transactions view here on the home screen. But if it's a check, it'll also move it into the um, pending or it'll move it into the print queue as well. So, yeah. Okay, so the one other kind of like shortcut feature is um, the copy. So if you have a transaction that is that complex um, journal entry, what you can do is you can copy that transaction and then just change the date to whatever you want the date to be. So, and it can be in the future as well. So, so um, at that point, you just save it and then it puts that transaction into the system. Okay, so now that we've entered in all our transactions, let's take a look at reports. So inside of Church 360 Ledger, there's four core reports, four main reports. And, um, we hear, you know, comments at times about, hey, there should be more reports. Um, 
if there's a report that you'd like to see inside the software, let us know. Um, just whatever it is, you know, go ahead and feed that to us. We'd love to hear from you and love to get feedback. Um, these are the four main ones. Every church is probably going to want to use these reports because of what, because of, of the information that they provide. Um, but if there's another report that's missing that um, we can, you know, help you provide, let us know. We'd love to get that feedback. Um, we meet regularly to discuss the direction of the software. So we'd love to hear from you. So um, the first report is the general ledger report. This report is going to show you all of your transactions. Um, you can set the date range here at the upper right. So you can select any of the years that you have information inside the system for. You can select the quarter. You can select a specific month. And of course, you can select a date range. So um, this window, you do have to click on the little panel to, um, to close this area. And you can actually see the equity line items here closing out for the fiscal year. So um, it does keep the system in balance. So let me go back here and then we'll do September here. So um, that's the month that we're working on right now. So um, when you're inside of here, you will see these little triangles and these little links here. The triangles allow you to filter your data based on transaction type or based on payee or based on account. So you can filter your transactions inside of this view. Um, one of the questions we get at times is how do you create a check register report and you can do that by filtering by type so you're going to select your date range and you're going to select the type as being checked then from there um, if it's a check register report usually it's just going to be the um, asset accounts at that point in time so you'll filter by asset account in most cases it's just unrestricted but there may be other um, other asset accounts that you should select as well so um, at that point, you could print this out or you could export it to Excel and then go from there. So um, these would be the checks that we wrote out of the software. And it um, looks like we have one that we didn't print yet, so that's why it's missing a check number. Okay, so um, filtering. The icon to the right of the word payee, that is a grouping icon. So you can group by... Um, the items that are inside of the payee list. So it's grouping together all the ones that don't have a payee. Then it's showing Ameren Electric, Derek Woods, Midwest Snow Removal. So it's showing all of those um, items grouped together. And you can even see the correction that we made, 25 cents. So it's showing all the line items, all the running balance items. Um, one of the things they wanted to do was um, increase the possibility of someone being able to um, make their own reports in Excel. So um, that's one thing that we heard during the development of this software, that people wanted that flexibility. But we're also hearing people want more reports as well. So, um, you know, we, we just need the feedback to decide what's the next right step when it comes to developing the software. Okay, so from there, um, you can print the report. Um, when printing reports, it's going to take it to a print view there from your web browser. You give it just a second and it will load. Um, everything looks good there, and then you can just go to print, and it'll send it out to your printer. Um, you can also export these to Excel. Um, when it comes to the general ledger report, lots of times people want to be able to total and add things up, and um, people have gotten just increasingly talented when it comes to using Microsoft Excel. Um, most people use it in their personal lives to um, craft different little um, little reports and so like I've been using Excel to do my books for my own personal life for years, but um, lots of people use Excel in different different scenarios. So um, from here, let Microsoft Excel open up our general ledger and you can use the um, sum function to um, sum columns. So enable editing and then you can um, sum them. So you can just go to FX and go to sum and there's lots of videos on YouTube about how to um, do amazing things with Excel. So then you can sum from here to here. Then that'll give you a total down at the bottom. So um, if it's voided, it'll go ahead and um, it'll have the word voided there to show that it's been voided. But um, you can see all your transactions at that point in time. Okay, so I'm gonna close the general ledger report. 
after the um, general ledger report, there's going to be the statement of income and expense. This report um, is going to show the income accounts at the top and the expense accounts down at the um, bottom. Um, one thing that I think is unique about this report, let me scroll back up to the top there, is it totals upwards. So like the categories are at the top and the totals are at the top. So this is the total income for 2019. And then this is the total unrestricted income for 2019. And then um, this is the restricted income for 2019. So um, everything totals upwards, which is kind of unique. Then down at the bottom, there's going to be um, income less expense to kind of know if we're in the, um, I guess, the red or the black for the year or for the time period that we have selected. You can um, collapse these sections. So um, if you've categorized and grouped the information for your reports, you can go in here and you can collapse these sections and it can make your report, um, I want to say more palatable, but it's just more easy to understand. It's easier to understand is what it is. So in looking at this, um, most churches don't budget their income, but you can enter in um, last year's actuals for your budget this year. And that's more of a take on, hey, did we receive as much income as we did last year? Um, I think sometimes people think um, you're requesting more money of the congregation when I think it's more I'm um, kind of understanding a picture of where you are financially. But, um, you know, and easily being able to see, hey, we're not bringing in as much as we did last year. Maybe we need to have some type of adjustment. So I um, mean, expenses, everybody budgets their expense, um, but probably you're just going to budget the um, um, unrestricted and not the restricted when when you're talking about income and expense so okay and you can collapse these sections as well so the better job that's done with categorizing things um, the easier it is to collapse these columns and um, I'm sorry collapse these sections and um, just be able to see the totals for those sections so you, you can make the report quite a bit shorter um, and then make it easier to kind of um, grasp and understand so um, when you export these reports to Excel, um, especially like the statement of income and expense, the ones that have the ability to collapse the um, categories and the sections here on the left hand side, it does keep the um, it does keep the formulas inside the report. So um, you'll notice here um, how it goes from eight to twenty two. So that section is really just hidden. I'm gonna unhide here. And then it has all of the accounts there. Um, I know one question that we had recently was around the account numbers. The account numbers do not show live inside of the software. Um, it was one of those questions that was um, brought up during the development of the software. So, um, it's kind of, and we've kind of found like a 50-50, like there's people who feel really strongly about the account numbers they must be there and then there were some people were like we don't even use account numbers why do they have to be there you know so um, we kind of just straddled the fence and we said hey we'll show them here when you export the report but we won't show them um, inside of the software unless i'll take a second to show this i'm going to pull that over to the other screen unless um and this is just a workaround and this might have been mentioned this morning but you can take the account numbers and include them inside of the name. So like this youth check-in is a good example. So instead of putting this number, the shepherd staff style um, account number over here, they put it in with the name. So if it's in with the name, then whenever you run the report, so let's um, pull up the uh, chart of accounts report, that account number will actually show on the report. So um, it does show when you export the report out to Excel, but if you want to show it all the time, you can literally just put it in with the name, um, which allows you to search by number or search by name in both scenarios. So um, it's just not a separate field that shows throughout the software. So um, that's a little workaround, a little best practice there for doing that. Okay, so let's go back to, we just exported the statement of income and expense. So let me pull that screen back over here. And um, I did show that, hey, it's hiding sections and hiding columns. Um, so inside of here, it does merge the first three rows together. 
So if you're going to start working with the um, if, if, if you're going to start working with control Z there, if you're going to start working with this report in Excel. First thing you're going to have to do is unmerge the top three columns. But from there, um, as you start looking through, you'll be able to see that the um, cells have formulas in them and they're not complex formulas. They're just basically adding all of these cells together is what they're doing. Um, if you take a section of cells out, so say I delete these three rows, I don't want um, I don't want that to be part of my report. So right click and I delete those. Um, it's going to break my references here at the top. But um, what I can do is take out the R refs there. It'll fix that one. And then um, actually, let me look at this one here. So I'm pretty sure I can just drag it down like this. Then it'll fix those two. Then I can drag it across and it'll fix those two. Is that correct? That's not correct. I have to fix these three here and then I can drag them to the right at that point. There we go. So I can fix those three and then I can drag them to the right there. And then that'll fix it right there. So um, I can take out sections and then I can just fix it like that. Um, and then at that point I can save it. If you're, um, th there is the question at times where people want to see um, monthly along with, so let me minimize that. So they want to see monthly along with the annual amounts. So in a case like that, you'll run the report for the month that you want. We just ran separate, uh, September. Then we can export to Excel. Give you know, that just a second. Then um, we can open up the second report there. And um, there we go. Okay. And um, then at that point, This is supposed to be the statement of income and expense. Okay, so statement of income and expense, export to Excel. Okay, here we go. Okay, so statement of income and expense. There we go. Okay, so put that one right there, put that one right there. And um, I think I expanded some sections there to make this look this way. So um, if I'm expanding sections, then um, I need to expand the sections over here before I copy it over. So you know, let's pull that back over just a little bit. So I'll just unhide those and then um, delete the miscellaneous here. Oh, enable editing. Okay, unhide these, delete the miscellaneous. Okay, so then um, unmerge, then just fix the uh, references here. Okay, I can just copy those three over and I'll fix it. Okay, so then um, I've got these two um, spreadsheets. This is the monthly, this is the annual. Um, they're the same accounts, columns and everything. And if I want the, um, I can copy these four columns over or I can copy one of the columns over. Um, And then um, I can get rid of any columns I don't want at that point in time. So 
and then this would be 2019 and this would be September. So I may want to change, you know, the column headers. So this may, may be September 2019 here. So, but um, I can keep and get rid of whatever information I want to at that point in time. And then that would be um, September and um, this would be month. And then this would be year over here on the right hand side. Okay, so I'm going to um, minimize that. That is the statement of income and expense. Um, let's look at the chart of accounts report. The chart of accounts report is the report that um, shows you all of your accounts here within the software. And it looks like at the pace that I'm going, I'm probably going to run about 15 minutes long. So we are going to send everybody a copy of the um, webinar. So if you have to drop off exactly at um, exactly at 2.30, feel free to do so, but I'm probably going to be about 15 minutes long, it looks like. So, Okay, so um, at this point in time, um, Chart of Accounts Report is going to show you all of your accounts. It'll show your restricted funds. It'll show your assets, um, show you your credits and debits. Um, and as you scroll down, you'll see your liabilities. You'll see your income accounts. I mean, you'll see your um, expense accounts. Now, you'll notice that when I collapsed these areas inside of the statement of income and expense, they showed up collapsed here. So um, you'll also notice when I change the date range, it carries over from section to section as well. So um, whenever you make changes um, in one area, they may tr be transported over to another area, especially the date range but also the collapsing of these columns when you're going from report to report. So um, chart of accounts report, it can be used as a trial balance sheet, uh, trial balance report, not a trial balance sheet, but a trial balance report, because it's going to show all your credits and debits, including unrestricted. And um, you can export that to Excel and run totals down at the bottom to make sure everything zeroes out. But this could be your trial balance so the chart of accounts report and the balance sheet report are very similar. So um, they have the exact same columns. They don't have all the accounts, so that's why it couldn't be used as a um, it couldn't be used as a um, trial balance report. But um, you know, same columns: starting balance, ending balance, debits, credits, um, change plus minus for the time period that we have selected and then change percent for the time frame that we have selected. Okay, so those are the four main reports inside of the software. Um, there's a few other reports that um, land under like the ad hoc type thing where you can kind of um, go to a section and generate a report, but um, it's not your standard like print or export to Excel type thing um, where you kind of understand the structure beforehand. Um, there's three of these that I'd like to show. So sometimes people will say, well, hey, how much money is in the building fund? And we know that the building fund is a part of the um, asset account. So with this building fund, it's got this running balance. So it doesn't zero out at the end of the year. Um, it just keeps going up or down depending on how much we spent. And we'll switch this from 2019 to, I'm sorry, from September 2019 to 2019. And we started out at 131,000 and we're now at 134,000. So um, by going up here to the top and selecting our restricted fund, this is basically a little report that we can print out and you can quickly find it. And that's one of the reasons why we decided to attach the um, assets are attached to restricted funds directly to the asset. One, you're stating exactly where the money's going to be. And two, you can create a report like this. Now, some people use liabilities because they want the flexibility of saying the money is split between two bank accounts, but that was one of the decisions they made with this software. <clears throat> and excuse me. Okay, so um, this is one of those reports. You just go here and you can um, print out this um, section of data, and then that would be the balance inside of that account. Um, another one is the budgets area. So when you go to budgets, it's going to show you all of your budgets, and um, it's not going to include income. This is just the budget for 2019, and you could select a prior year or a future year, and then you can export it to Excel, and you can email it to somebody, or you could print that information. So 
This is just a straight budget report right here. And then the third one is underpayees. So um, lots of times people will ask, well, does Church 360 Ledger offer a um, W-9 or um, a 1099 or something like that? So something that shows how much was paid to that person. And um, it does not, but it provides the information for how much was paid out to that person for a time period, and it can be printed from there. So um, you can use this report to do that for a specific person. So you can go to reports and go to, um, I'm sorry, go to reports, go to the gear and go to payees, and then you can click on that little hovering history button to um, find out how much was paid to that person during that time period or paid to that company during that time period. Okay, so that's the um, third little ad hoc report inside of the system. Okay, so why don't we take a look at the bank account reconciliation, then I'm going to show the event log. So inside of Church 360 Ledger, there's the opportunity to do a bank account reconciliation. So um, basically, we're verifying what took place at the bank matches what we've recorded here inside of our software. So we are going to reconcile only bank accounts. So um, central trust checking is the one that we're going to reconcile. And this reconciliation would include um, all of the restricted funds as well. So any money that came out of this account would be reconciled when we reconcile this um, bank account. So um, my data is a little old inside of here, so I'm actually going to reconcile for October. I'm a little behind on um, keeping up to date with the bank account reconciliations. I hope I don't get in trouble, but um, I'm going to reconcile it now. And I'm going to get caught up. So whenever you're doing a bank account reconciliation, you'll select the time span for which you want to reconcile your transaction. So um, Usually it's not completely square. It's not January 1 through this, um, January 1. It's not January 1 through January 31st, or in my case, October 1 through October 31st. So um, sometimes it may overlap. You may have somebody who held on to a check for a little um, while, and then they, you know, cash the check and it shows up a month later on your statement. So you can go in here and um, change the time span and go back a little ways. And then that will pull in additional transactions that you can do for your um, reconciliation. So we're going to say 10-31-2018. Okay. And then um, at that point, we've drilled all the way down to our reconciliation where we can click the reconcile button. Then at that point, um, it will remember the last um, ending balance and put that in there. So the last time I did a reconciling a reconciliation in here, um, it um, ended in fifteen thousand dollars. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to enter in my starting balance from my bank statement five one five one six four eighty one, and then I'm going to enter in my ending balance six two nine. 27349. I think this is correct. So then that's not correct though. 6292737349. Okay, so um, at that point in time I can go through and usually I scroll to the bottom and I start from there. So um, at that point I'll go through and I'll click on my transactions and they'll start to um, clear at that point in time. You'll even notice when I hover over this one it's going to um, let me know that all three of these need to be checked because they're all um, highlighted at that point in time. So, um, so that's $5,000. Um, I may have a transaction of $5,000, but I need to know to check all three of these. So I'm going through and I'm selecting those items. And actually, those are not on my bank statement. These are, though. Okay, so then I start checking them. It'll have statement difference, which is the difference between the starting balance and the ending balance. Then it will have um, selected difference. That's these transactions that I've been selecting, and it has the off buy. 
And usually what I do is when I see the transaction on my bank statement and I see it on the screen, I'll put a little check on my bank statement and I'll check off each one of these. So when I get to the very end, every single one of my transactions should have a check by them. So let's see here. So 652, 50, 30, 30, 5,000, 110,000, 799. Oh, let me click cancel here just for a second. I'm going to type this in one more time. This worked when I tested it earlier. Um, 629-27349. and I know why it's not working. Um, I'm going to cheat on my reconciliation. Okay, so um, at that point, when your balance gets to zero, um, you'll just save your reconciliation at that point in time. So um, my fake bank statement had an error on it. So um, I don't have a real bank statement to do a bank account reconciliation. So I had to create my own fake bank statement. So um, in looking at that, once it gets to zero, you'll click save. Um, if your difference is not zero, um, it will not allow you to save your bank account reconciliation. It, um, it prevents you from saving an unbalanced bank account reconciliation. If you're entering in and selecting your transactions and you need to close and make a correction or a change, you can click on the orange dollar sign, go in, make whatever correction or change that you need to make, then um, go back down into your um, Go back down into your bank account. Then um, finish off your reconciliation. Um, once it's at zero, you can click save and it will save it. You do not want to click cancel unless you want to start your bank account reconciliation over from scratch. So um, if, you, if you feel good about it, then, um, you know, kind of continue and go forward from there. But if you have to start over, you can click cancel. So when you save it, that does lock those transactions into place. Then um, from there, you can go to the gear and you can go to, I'm sorry, go to reports and go to event log, our fifth and final report. And then you'll be able to, we did the reconciliation this year. Then you'll be able to print out your bank account reconciliation. So let me do that one more time. So go here, go to the event log. And then um, it's going to have these hyperlinks that allow you to jump over to different parts of the software. So most of them are going to be transactions, but you can view your bank account reconciliation. Lots of times people are like, hey, how can I print out a bank account reconciliation? This is where you go to do that. You go to the event log, 
and then you can print it from there. So you can go to print. So the event log is kind of like the um, part of the software where it's um, keeping track of things that are going on. So um, the person who's the administrator may want to go in here and look to see what someone else has done in the software. Um, or sometimes you just forgot you did something, you want to go in here and verify it and check it. So um, it'll allow you to go through and review that information and take a look at transactions. So um, pretty neat. Okay, well, that's the information that I had for this session. So let's go ahead and let's start our quiz. Um, I think just about all of the questions are true or false during our quiz. So we're going to go ahead and launch the first quiz question. And let me double check to make sure that's working the way it should be. And it looks like it is. So true or false, handwritten checks will appear in the print queue along with checks to be printed. True or false? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and share the results. So we had 88% um, say true. We must have had a like a rounding um, error there or something. We had 13% say false. So the majority of the people said true, and the answer is true. All checks are sent to the print queue. To remove a handwritten check from the print queue, check the box to the left of the check and click the mark as printed button. So um, all checks are going to show up and you'll just mark those as printed. Um, so that's question number one. Question number two. Okay, there we go. True or false, when creating a journal entry, applying a credit to a bank account will decrease the bank account. So um, for those that have the uh, transaction debits and credits chart there, um, you, you can use that to cheat. Um, some of you, if, if you're an accountant or a CPA, you know this off the top of your head. So you've been doing credits and debits for years, so it's a no-brainer. But um, let me give everybody just a couple more minutes there. A couple more moments, not minutes. Okay. So I'm going to close the poll. Here we go. And share the results. We were unanimous this time. 100% said true. Good job, everyone. So the answer is true. A credit to an asset will decrease the account balance, while a debit will increase the account balance. So that, that trips people up sometimes. True or false? So this is going to be poll question number three. True or false? The chart of accounts report can be used as a trial balance report. True or false? Okay, about 20, 30 more seconds there. Oh, it looks like everybody's responded. Good job, everyone. So close the poll and share the results. So we had an 88-13 split. Looks like we have an extra percentage in there. And um, the answer is true. This report shows the total credits and debits for each account. For specific sums or totals, the report can be exported to Excel and modified. Okay, question number four. It looks like this one is multiple choice. So question number four, launching the poll there. True or false, you are working with the bank account reconciliation and you find out that you need to enter a transaction. What should you do? Should you A, click the save button, or B, click the cancel button, or C, click the orange dollar sign button, A, B, or C? Okay, it looks like everybody has voted. So I'm gonna close the poll 
and share the results. So we had a, a three-way split, but I guess we could say question C won overall. So 13% um, said A, 13% said B, and 75% said C. Okay, so I'm going to hide the poll and show the answer. And the answer is C. Um, you want to click the home button, the orange dollar sign. This will take you out of the reconciliation, but not delete your work. Once the transaction has been entered, just open the reconciliation and continue clearing your transaction. Please, please, please only click the cancel button if you want to start over. I would note that clicking save is disabled if the balance is not zero. So um, you're really trying to get that balance to zero. And if it's not zero, it's not even going to allow you to click it. Um, it'll look like it'll click, but when you hover over and click, there'll be no reaction. So um, technically, it's already saved in the background, so you can click save, but it, every time you check something, it saves it automatically for you. Okay, and then our fifth and final quiz question is true or false? To print a reconciliation, uh, wait a second, let me launch the poll. There we go. True or false? To print a reconciliation report, go to the event log. True or false? Okay, it looks like everybody has voted there. So I'm going to close the poll and share the results. There we go. So 75% said true, 25% said false. So we had a split decision there, but we are leaning towards true. And the answer is true. A bank account reconciliation can only be printed from the event log. So whenever you um, finish up that bank account reconciliation, you'll just go to the event log to print that report. Um, and I, the note would be for the new users of Church 360 Ledger that that very first bank account reconciliation does lock um, does lock transactions. And I did not say this, but I need to. But it also locks your initial balances as well. So um, whenever you're um, starting out with the software, the balances are malleable. Like you can enter in a number. If it's incorrect, you can go back and fix it. Running that bank account reconciliation locks those balances in. So that first one is kind of like a, I guess, a line. Um, and it's more like a hard line than a line in the sand or anything like that. So um, you're kind of saying from this point forward, we're saying the balances are correct. Any other corrections will have to be like a journal entry type, um, style correction at that point. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. Do you have any questions? Um, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and I'll hold on here for a few seconds and um, um, give you time to type those in. People do drop off pretty quickly, so I want to thank everybody for attending today's webinar. Thank you so much for all your patience and all your time. Um, so um, we do hope, you that, hope that you enjoyed today's session, and if you have any questions in the future, please feel free to reach out to you. We'd love to hear from you. The feedback helps us make decisions. Um, we don't want anybody to struggle or be frustrated with the software. We're really here to help. So. I mean, you can give us a call, you can shoot us an email, you can call me, um, call Jordan, um, just reach out to us. We'd love to help you in this, um, in this task and lift a little burden there, so. Okay. Well, I'm not seeing any questions. Um, well, if there aren't any questions, um, you have our contact information. You can reach out to us at any time. Um, I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of the um, day. Hope you have a blessed evening, and I will talk to you soon. Thanks, everyone. For Jordan Bogart, this is Rod Kyles. We are signing off.